Can hear now. All right, folks. So we had some technical difficulties. I think we've worked out the audio and visual component. If you're having issues hearing or seeing, go ahead and type it into the, the chat bar. We are back, moving back to goals of the presentation here. So we're basically starting over. You missed nothing. <laughs> All right. The goals today are we're going to talk about pneumonia basics. We're going to review the old HCAP guidelines, talk about what is no longer the case. And then we're going to spend a deep dive on the review of the new guidelines. So we'll talk about the state of the art for empiric therapy for community acquired pneumonia or CAP, hospital acquired pneumonia or HAP, and ventilator acquired pneumonia or VAP. We'll touch on rapid diagnostics, where the state of the art is in terms of getting the identification of the pathogen at the bedside. And then we'll move into risk assessment for multidrug resistant organisms. Uh, and then the big closer is really the community acquired treatment in pneumonia. So we'll talk about local resistant patterns and where we are today in Wisconsin. So this is your this is your med school overview of pneumonia pathogens. I don't want to belabor the point. I know we all slept through a microbiome, so I'll try to make it interesting. Um, outpatient pathogens. It's really unclear. What is there as an outpatient? We don't know. Why don't we know? We don't know because we're not testing for it. We're not doing sputum cultures. We're not doing blood cultures. We're treating these patients empirically and sending them home. That being said, our excellent academic colleagues are doing research on the subject, right? So you'll find studies from all over the world. You'll find studies from the US, from Canada, from Iran, from Australia. What are our outpatient pathogens? So they'll actually go and do sputum samples and blood cultures and do PCR and find out what the pathogens are. Now, it's going to vary based on your community biome, but in general, the rule is strep pneumo is still king, okay? Greater than 65% of the time, we're dealing with strep pneumo. After that, we actually find that we're treating a lot of viral pneumonias or upper respiratory infections and treat them as pneumonias. Now, that's tricky, obviously. The atypical or walking pneumonias can sometimes masquerade as viral symptoms, but largely as a medical community, we're trying to get away from treating viruses, and so that's still, that's still a big bugaboo out there is uh, treating viruses as a pneumonia, and we can talk more about that. And then mycoplasma and chlamydia are the two most common atypicals. Remember, the atypical organisms are really tiny organisms or sometimes intracellular organisms that don't usually respond to beta-lactams or your cephalosporins, basically. And so these are the atypical organisms are the reason that the macrolides or azithromycin is out there is to treat these less common atypical organisms. But again, strep pneumo is king. In terms of inpatient pathogens, again, strep pneumo greater than 50% of the time. Um, followed again by mycoplasma. Mycoplasma is one of the worst walking pneumonias. It masquerades as a virus for a long time and sort of unmasks itself in a rapid fashion. Um, and then again, viruses are still common even in the inpatient setting. And Legionella and Haemophilus get uh, honorable mentions. In Wisconsin, we did recently have a couple of Legionella outbreaks, so I'm sure that topic is fresh on a lot of people's minds. Less common bugs out there are uh, Staph aureus and Pseudomonas and the Enterobacteriaceae. So basically, Staph aureus is a particularly nasty gram-positive, and then Pseudomonas and Enterobacteriaceae are gram-negative organisms. We don't usually expect to find gram-negatives in the respiratory tract, but they can absolutely get in there, and when they do, they wreak havoc. So these are organisms that are particularly virulent um, and need to be on our radar because they are at high risk for resistance and at high risk for causing significant morbidity and mortality. And then, uh, you know, the elephant in the room is probably resistant strep pneumo. Um, there's a lot of other multidrug resistant organisms out there. Pseudomonas is a, is a close second for things we're worried about. But resistant strep pneumo is a, um, a significant threat and uh, one of the main reasons for treatment failure in terms of outpatient antibiotics. So those are our pathogens in a nutshell. And now how about treatment? Now, I don't like to get into the weeds on these webinars because treatment is so specific to your community, so specific to your individual hospital biogram, and so specific to your patient. So if you were to take these, um, this slide and apply it to all your patients, that would be a mistake. You've got to look at individual medication regimens they're on, individual allergy profiles, et cetera. But in general, this is how I am thinking of community-acquired pneumonia in my practice and in Wisconsin. First of all, we have to acknowledge that viruses are out there, and we have to have clinical confidence in our diagnosis of a virus. So if a patient comes into your practice and they have uh, cough, rhinorrhea, maybe they have some reactive airway disease, they've got um, 
you know, a sore throat with it. That is a typical viral syndrome. You do not need to send a chest x-ray on that patient. You do not need to treat with antibiotics unless you have a compelling reason to do so or something stands about, out about that case. Um, if you have a month of symptoms, you know, you might be thinking, hey, this could be mycoplasma. I really thought this was a virus and it was going to improve. You might want to dig a little deeper in that case. But by and large, we need to have a lot more confidence in saying this, these are viral symptoms. It hasn't been long enough. The symptoms aren't severe enough. We're going to hold off on antibiotics at this time. Asthma flares are the same thing. So when a patient has known reactive airway disease, we do not need to treat with antibiotics. In fact, it is a best practice not even to shoot a chest x-ray with asthmatics unless it's a moderate to severe exacerbation. So when you see a patient in clinic with asthma, we shouldn't be sending chest x-rays. You're at high risk for a false positive for seeing streak artifact and thinking it's a pneumonia. It's okay to treat with, um, with albuterol and steroids in that case. COPD is a little bit trickier, and we actually have a whole webinar coming up on COPD in July. Um, but in COPD, there are recommendations out there, sort of conflicting recommendations. Some say call a virus a virus and don't treat. Some say go ahead and add azithromycin. I like to use a procalcitonin if I'm unsure and sort of uh, have a laboratory adjunct to help guide my decision. For strep, no, for strep pneumo in the Midwest, um, Augmentin absolutely works. Doxycycline absolutely works. And so our resistance rates of strep pneumo for the beta-lactams and for doxycycline are actually quite low. Um, Azithromycin does not work. Azithromycin resistance or strep resistance to azithromycin is now greater than 50%. It is a dead drug for strep pneumo in the Midwest. And so if you're treating for community acquired pneumonia, your first line agent should not be azithromycin because remember, strep pneumo is still king. Azithromycin will be effective against the atypicals, but not against strep for more than 50% of your patients in the Midwest. For resistant strep pneumo, I like doxycycline. Oh, it says doxycycle there. <laughs> uh, I like doxycycle. Uh, quinolones um, are an iffy drug. We can talk more about that. And then if um, Bactrim resistance is, uh, is greater than or less than 80%, let me say it this way. If Bactrim is 80% or more effective in your community, then Bactrim is still recommended. But I know a lot of our area hospitals, Bactrim resistance has actually dropped lower than 80%. And so if, um, if Bactrim is effective less than 80% of the time, you should, you should take that drug off of your suggested list. And then finally, for the atypicals, again, these are the minor category of pneumonias, but mycoplasma, chlamydia, legionella, uh, doxycycline is still very effective, and then the macrolides and azithromycin are effective in that category as well. And so I, in my personal practice, I really am using doxycycline quite frequently in the Midwest. It's a um, generic drug. It's an effective drug. And uh, it covers most of the things that we're looking for. Now, obviously, the bad bugs are out there. So if you're concerned about Staph aureus, we're now adding vancomycin or an equivalent like linazolid. Linazolid now has an oral option, although it's quite expensive. Uh, Pseudomonas is out there. There are a lot of IV options for Pseudomonas, but not a lot of oral options. We talk a lot in this journal club series about saving our quinolones. We're trying to withhold our fluoroquinolones for the times when we really need them. This would be an example of a time that we really need quinolones for pseudomonas. And then enterobacteriaceae, again, is out there. And we'll talk specifically about um, this extenda beta lactamase resistant uh, enterobacteriaceae, or ESBL. There are certain health systems in our state that have high ESBL rates, and that's a true challenge in terms of multidrug resistant organisms. These are the superbugs that you hear about. If you get a carbapenem resistant ESBL, that is an untreatable effect infection. Now, we've seen almost no carbapenem resistant ESBL in Wisconsin, but we don't want to start seeing that. Again, if this went way over your head, if you feel like you just got lectured in, micro, in microbiology, don't worry about it. We have plenty of time for questions, and we're going to break this down to the most simple components starting now. So what was HCAP? Emphasis here is was. HCAP is no longer around, but it was healthcare-associated pneumonia or healthcare-acquired pneumonia. It was born in 2005, and it died in 2016. It had an 11-year run of recommending overly broad-spectrum antibiotic agents for a large cohort of patients. Now, of course, the intention here was good. The thought process be behind HCAP was to risk stratify people and say, are you at risk for a bad bug? And if you're at risk for it, can we really hit this bug hard in order to prevent multidrug-resistant organisms? And so the criteria were, um, if you had been hospitalized for more than two days within the past 90 days, if you were a resident of a nursing home or long-term care facility, if you were on chronic dialysis, if you were on home infusion therapy, if you had home wound care, 
or if you had a family member with a drug-resistant organism, we would treat you with broad-spectrum antibiotics for pneumonia symptoms. The problem was that HCAP was not particularly sensitive, not particularly specific, and because multidrug resistant organisms, while they're out there, are not that common, it had a relatively low predictive, positive predictive value for actually getting the right cohort of patients. So this is an individual who might say, help, these categories are too rigid for me. He's 35 years old. He has a past medical history of a two-day hospital stay for an appendectomy um, a couple of weeks ago. I meant to say 10 days ago, not 10 weeks. Um, and now he's presenting to you with, uh, oh, actually 10 weeks ago, that's fine. It's uh, so um, three months ago, roughly. He's now presenting to you with no fever, a productive cough, midfield crackles, a low bar infiltrate on chest X-ray, and O2 sat of 88% on room air. You decide to admit him to the hospital really for an oxygen requirement. So before 2016, um, he would have been, uh, before the you know, HCAP died, he would have been treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, something like Vank and Zosin, right? So now we're treating for um, staff, we're treating for drug resistant organisms, and a gentleman who's otherwise healthy and has, you know, a, I would say a relatively mild pneumonia. He probably would have been discharged on orals, except that he had this oxygen requirement. Nowadays, we would treat him essentially with ceftriaxone and azithromycin as a community acquired pneumonia. He would probably stay in the hospital for a day or two and then get discharged on an oral antibiotic. Hopefully, you'd be able to drop that azithromycin once you had um, a sputum culture back. Uh, and that's, again, the exact problem with HCAP. The theory was right on, but multidrug resistant organism in this population, the population that they divined, was low. And so the positive predicted value was also low. It was this classic tension between individual health and population health. On the one hand, you want to do the best thing for the individual, and if they do have a multidrug resistant organism, you want to nip that in the bud. You want to hit it hard and really give them the best chance of survival, right? Survival and low morbidity. On the other hand, we can't be using broad spectrum agents so frequently, so willy nilly, that we drive up costs for the healthcare system and that we drive up drug resistance in general. And so these guidelines resulted in widespread inappropriate broad spectrum antibiotic use. They got reviewed after 10 years. The scientists in infectious disease and pulmonology recognized that the pendulum had swung too far. And with this webinar, we're in the process of dialing it back, getting back to a more practical solution. So what is that practical solution? Here's who's left. We have CAP, HAP, and VAP. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of these mnemonics, but they do kind of roll off the tongue. Um, and if you're on hospital rounds or you're signing off a patient, uh, it's pretty convenient just to say CAP, HAP, or VAP. CAP is community acquired pneumonia, and we're gonna get deep into the, the, a visual presentation of what these mean. But community acquired pneumonia, or CAP, is a patient who got their infection from the community. So even if they're admitted, if they get their infectious symptoms within that first 48 hours, they probably didn't catch that in the hospital. Pneumonia just doesn't brew that quickly. They were probably already having those uh, symptoms prior to admission. For hospital-acquired pneumonia, or nosocomial pneumonia, or HAP, um, this is a pneumonia that occurs once you're in the hospital, so 48 hours, after 48 hours in the hospital. Um, and again, this makes a lot of sense. We're looking for bad bugs. We're looking for things like MRSA. We're looking for things like um, resistant organisms. And where do bad bugs live? They live in the hospital setting. You know, I think about my hospital, it's, I think of it as a funnel for the Tri-County area. All of the worst bugs in the area are coming into one single building. And of course, we do great infection control. Of course, we, do, we mask up and we wash our hands and everything else. And still, it is a challenge keeping these bugs under control. And then finally, ventilator-assisted pneumonia, or VAP, is a type of healthcare-associated pneumonia or hospital-acquired pneumonia that develops more than 48 hours after intubation. So this is a specific entity that happens after you've been intubated. So looking at this table that I made, if you look on the left there for community-acquired pneumonia, let's say a patient is admitted to the hospital and on day one they get fevers, shortness of breath, crackles on lung exam, and an infiltrate on chest X-ray. Even though they're in the hospital, because it's day one, that would still be community-acquired pneumonia, and we'd be treating with typical community-acquired pneumonia treatment. So that's a patient I might treat with doxycycline alone or with um, a cephalosporin alone. After 48 hours of hospital admission, so this, this patient here in, in this theoretical chart here, they actually were intubated on day two for whatever reason. The patient's been intubated, and on day three, they now get their pneumonia. So 
It's greater than 48 hours after admission, but it's not greater than 48 hours after intubation. So this patient would be hospital-acquired pneumonia. You would now want to cover, and we'll get into the, the weeds a little bit on this, but you might want to cover now for MRSA. You might want to cover for pseudomonas, depending on your hospital biogram, but you wouldn't necessarily want to double cover for pseudomonas as we do with ventilator-assisted pneumonia. This patient would still be treated as hosp hospital-acquired pneumonia. And then let's say the patient had been intubated on day two, three more days go by, and that's when they develop their crackles, that's when they develop their fever, that's when their stats drop. That patient would now have ventilator-associated pneumonia, ventilator-acquired pneumonia, um, and they would be treated with the most broad spectrum, most assertive uh, antimicrobial agents. So really, it's all about the timing. In terms of symptoms and signs, this is basic. This is not, there's nothing special about HAP, there's nothing special about VAP, they are pneumonias. So symptoms are things that we actually, that the patient will complain about, right? They'll complain about shortness of breath or dyspnea. They'll complain about cough. They'll say, every time I cough, I'm bringing up this green junk. I feel like I've got fevers and chills. I'm shaking at night. Whenever I breathe in deeply, it hurts. Those would be your typical pneumonia symptoms. Same thing for HAP and VAP. And then signs are things that we see objectively on exam. So you're gonna look at the patient and see that they have fevers. You'll take their temp and, and actually record an elevated temperature. You'll see that they're breathing quickly or having tachypnea. They have a tachycardic heart rate. You'll listen to their lung exam and hear crackles. You'll do a chest x-ray and see a new infiltrate. You'll run their labs and you might see a leukocytosis with a left shift or a bandemia, elevated lactate, something like that. Now, empiric therapy, again, is going to depend on your health system. So this is one of my favorite algorithms. It's publicly available on a link on a website called palmcriticalcare.org, and it is somewhere where you could start your own algorithm, but I don't want to suggest that this is for every hospital. It is completely dependent on your biogram um, and what organisms live in your hospital, in your community. But if you just follow through the chart here, our goal is to get every patient to the far left. Our goal is to say, this patient doesn't have risk for MRSA, they don't have risk for pseudomonas activity, and we're gonna be able to cover them with one anti-pseudomonal agent that also covers for MSSA, which would basically be a cephalosporin. That is the goal, except if you can't do that, obviously. If you can't say they're low risk for MRSA, if you can't say they're low risk for pseudomonas, then they're gonna need broader coverage. So again, I don't wanna belabor the point, I'm gonna leave this slide as a reference to you, but we'll walk, just walk through it sweet, quickly. The first step is the time course. When did the pneumonia develop? This is for HAP or VAP. If it developed within greater than 48 hours after hospitalization, you're in the HAP box. Greater than 48 hours after intubation, you're in the VAP box. Now in the VAP box, you're already going to broad spectrum coverage. So you're considering MRSA coverage, you're considering double pseudomonal coverage. If you're in the HAP box, the hospital acquired pneumonia, and the patient is not ARDS, they're not septic shock, you are now moving away from that double pseudomonal coverage but you're thinking about MRSA coverage. Should I add MRSA coverage, you ask yourself? Well, let's look at my hospital biogram. If your MRSA rates are between 10 and 20%, um, then there's a high risk for staph aureus and you should probably, for methicillin resistant staph aureus, and you should probably add some MRSA coverage. If not, then you're, you're moving down the algorithm on the left there, and you have to think about the individual patient risk factors. Do they have structural lung disease? So is this a COPD -er who has, um, who has you know, functional movement deficits, who has a poor um, FEV1, who has diabetes. If, you, if you're seeing these risk factors pile up, you'll probably wanna add some pseudomonal coverage um, and actually double coverage for pseudomonas. If it's a relatively young person, like our example earlier, who has few um, comorbidities, no structural lung disease, that patient could get away with the cephalosporin alone. So again, the goal here is to choose the right empiric therapy and then wait for testing, wait for sputum cultures, wait for clinical response, and de-escalate care as soon as possible. I'm sure we'll have some questions about this at the end, so absolutely lay them on me. Now, a lot of people are asking, what about rapid diagnostics? This is the future. This is the dream. This is what we all want to happen that isn't currently happening. We want our patient to come to the bedside, provide a test of some sort, a blood test, a sputum test, some sort of test, and within an hour, two hours, three hours, we can actually tell them not only what bug they have, what's growing in their lungs, but what it's gonna be resistant to, and we can choose the perfect antibiotic. That is the future, that's what we're all waiting for, and it's not here. 
It's just not here yet. If you're listening and you're in a health system that's using rapid diagnostics effectively, I would actually love to hear about your experience. And, um, and I encourage you to please join in in the question period and tell us what you're doing. But from my experience so far and going around the state, what we need are rapid diagnostics that are quick, obviously, that are accurate, that are easy to use, so these aren't send out labs, these aren't you know, an eight hour spin or something. And then probably most importantly, are cost effective. We can actually incorporate these into routine patient care in a way that doesn't break the bank. Now, if we get there, we will be able to treat um, these infections in a lot more sophisticated manner. But until we get there, we are left with empiric therapy. And when you do empiric therapy, by nature, you're going to be overly treating some proportion of patients. And so I'm very hopeful that in the next two years, we'll actually be having a very similar webinar on rapid diagnostics. So we have nucleic acid testing is out there. This is basically like rapid blood cultures. That would be able to tell you what the organism is, but not necessarily its susceptibilities in a rapid fashion. There's this all-in-one multiplex PCR. And so that is um, essentially going to, join, going to give you the organism, again, in a rapid fashion based on any body fluid. So you can put in CSF, you can put in sputum, you can put, it, put in blood and get a rapid answer. Um, high throughput sequencing is essentially rapid DNA sequencing where you could, again, get the exact organism, possibly even its resistance patterns. And then there's this mass spectrometry, which is similar to DNA testing. It's a similar effect, which based on the size of the organism, the weight of the organism would be able to tell you what you're dealing with. So there are private companies out there that were, are working on all of these. There are studies for each of these that says they're ready for prime time, only to find that they are rapidly debunked as we try to actually apply it across populations. So I think we're very close. I'm hopeful that before 2020, we'll have a real product that's FDA approved for rapid diagnostics. Um, and some of you in your centers may even, even be working on trials in this area, uh, but I have not really seen this applied effectively in Wisconsin yet at a hospital level scale. Um, and again, if you have some good experience with rapid diagnostics, please chime in for us. Well, what if you don't fit into either categories? What if your patient comes in and they don't really fit into HAP? They don't really fit into VAP? Well, who are we dealing with there? Let's take a look at this gentleman. He's 70 years old. He has COPD and diabetes, so he has some comorbidities. He lives at home, not in a nurse, nursing home setting or anything. And two weeks ago, he was hospitalized for dehydration. At that time, his BUN was 60. Today, his BUN is 25. So he's maybe a little bit dry today, but not, not uh, you know, solidly dehydrated. He's presenting with fever, productive cough, midfield crackles, a corresponding infiltrate on chest x-ray, and you decide to admit him. We'll actually talk about admission later, but he, you know, generally he's elderly, he's got comorbidities, so he's a little bit dry, you err on the side of hospital admission. So in 2016, before the death of HCAP, he would have again been treated with broad spectrum antibiotics, so zosin and vancomycin, gorillacillin, if you would. Now in 2017 onward, 2019, we're gonna treat this as community acquired pneumonia. So this gentleman developed his infection before hospitalization. Um, and if you look at the IDSA guidelines, you would treat with something like ceftriaxone plus or minus azithromycin based on risk factors. Um, COPD, you could argue that you'd wanna add that atypical coverage. Or if you look at up to date, you might treat this gentleman with doxycycline alone or Leviquin alone. These would be some of the options. Um, I have my preferences. I'm sure you have yours. I'm sure your antimicrobial stewardship committee has theirs. And so that's always a healthy discussion to have is which drugs do we wanna cycle in and which drugs do we wanna cycle out. But this would be a patient who doesn't really have HAP or VAP. They have community acquired pneumonia with some risk factors. How do you choose what to give him? I like to get a little more sophisticated. So I wanna have as much information at my, at my um, fingertips as possible. And part of having more information is to look at population health. Look at large studies of, um, of populations of patients and try to apply them to the patient in front of you. Now, MD Calc is a private product, but it's a free product. I get no royalties from them. I think a lot of us are using something like this, a risk stratification tool from an online um, app on your phone or an online website. And what I like to use is the DRIP score. So this is an evidence-based tool for drug resistance in pneumonia. So it's a risk stratification tool. Do you have a multi-drug resistant organism or are you likely to have one? And it's essentially uh, predicts your risk for community-acquired pneumonia due to resistant pathogens. It's a zero to 14 point scale. Um, there are major criteria where you get two points and minor criteria where you get one point. And if you have a score of less than four, then you are at low risk for drug resistant pneumonia and you would not add um, a broad spectrum agent. 
If you have a drip score greater than four, then you would add a broad spectrum agent. Now, do we have a question? I see Annie looking at me here. <laughs> um, not so much a question, but more a comment. Absolutely. So I'll read it out loud so that you can give us your input. Um, Tristan says that uh, for rule out of MRSA pneumonia, they have had success with MRSA NAIRS PCR swab. Three hour turnaround after collection, upwards of 99% NPV for MRSA pneumonia. Essentially, can give one dose of Vanco and then discontinue if swab negative. Excellent. Thank you, Tristan, for weighing in. So I know Tristan well. He is a uh, antimicrobial stewardship friendly pharmacist, and he is really pushing the envelope in terms, push, in a good way, pushing the envelopes. I should say, advancing the field and using novel techniques out there for uh, rapid diagnostics. And so it sounds like in Tristan's healthcare setting, they have the budget and the antimicrobial stewardship support to actually to save costs by identifying an organism early, and they found a, a test that is still patented that's gonna do that for them. So that is very good. Um, the healthcare economics of that may work for your healthcare setting, they may not. A lot of it depends on whether you have the evidence to actually prove that you're saving your healthcare system money by using an on-brand test like that. Um, but that's excellent. That is a great example of what the future may well look like. So thank you for sharing that example. I work in a small community hospital our antimicrobial stewardship budget is, um, is borrowed from other budgets. So when we want to do an antimicrobial stewardship project, we have to kind of go to the ICU budget or go to the ED budget and say, do we have room to work in this best practice in our existing budget? I probably couldn't get approval for rapid diagnostics at this time for cost purposes, but I could get approval for something like the DRIP score, a quality improvement project where we're asking clinicians on a patient by patient basis to assess their risk for a multi-drug resistant organism. So let's use the patient in that example, the 70 year old male with COPD and diabetes, a BUN of 25. He's had no antibiotic use in 60 days. He is not a long-term care resident. He's not being tube fed. He has no prior drug-resistant pneumonias in the last year, so he has no major risk factors. He has not been hospitalized within 60 days. He does have COPD. Let's even say he has poor functional status, sure. No H2 blocker, no active wound care. For this patient, we would actually give him a uh, two minor risk factors and a DRIP score of two. Now, this is kind of cool because when we first looked at this example, I saw a 70 year old, he had COPD, he had diabetes, he was recently hospitalized for dehydration. I'm thinking, man, this guy's pretty sick, he's got a lot of comorbidities, he might be at risk for, high, for a multi-drug resistant organism. When I actually look at the population health and apply it to my patient, I find that he's actually pretty low risk. And so I would probably treat him with ceftriaxone alone, augmentin alone, doxycycline alone. I probably would not necessarily add my atypical coverage, definitely wouldn't do a vancomycin strategy for this patient. And so I've actually changed my clinical impression based on the population health DRIP score. And there are other scoring systems out there. You may have a different scoring system that's your preference. If you want to weigh in at the end of the call or uh, let us know what you're using, I'd be very interested. Now, you can even get more sophisticated. You can say, should I be admitting this patient in the first place? That's kind of interesting. Once you realize that your patient might be lower risk for multi-drug resistant organisms than you originally thought, maybe they don't need to be in the healthcare setting at all. Um, there are different scores out there. There's the PESI score. I like to use the CURB 65 score. And what this does is it helps augment our clinical gestalt. Again, based on population health metrics, who should be coming into the hospital in the first place? And so CURB 65 is again available in MD MDCalc. It's evidence-based, it's been prospectively validated, and it estimates the community-acquired pneumonia mortality and helps us determine, should this patient come into the hospital or stay out? Remember, bad bugs live in the hospital. So this guy has COPD, you know, the guy we were talking about earlier, has COPD, he has diabetes. Do I even wanna be bringing him into the hospital? So if your patient is confused, that buys you a point. If their BUN is greater than 19, that buys you a point. So his was, he has one point now. Let's say he has, his respiratory rate was not greater than 30. He had no low blood pressures. Age 65 would buy him a point. My patient would be a score of a two. And so he would have a 6.8% based on population health studies risk of 30 day mortality risk. And so that kind of puts you in the gray zone, likely discharge, likely admit. If he has a caretaker at home who is very um, proactive, able to get his meds, able to help care for him if he needs something like nebulizer treatments, if he has a PCP who can get him into clinic in a rapid fashion to um, do a follow-up chest x-ray, to do a follow-up pulse ox, make sure that he's getting better, not worse. If he is insured and has 
a, um, a community support network, meaning he's not homeless, he's not in prison, something like that. This would be a candidate where you might actually be able to discharge him. And you might be able to say, I think his 30-day mortality risk is actually even a little bit lower because he has such a strong support network. Um, if he didn't, however, if you say, well, he lives alone, uh, I don't know, he hasn't filled the last few prescriptions, I know for a fact that his PCP is backed up for weeks, might not be able to get him in next week, that's a patient you'd want to err on the side of admitting. And so the CURB score just gives you some extra information on whether this patient would be safest for an outpatient or inpatient setting. A lot of people think of the hospital as a place of health. I think of the hospital as a place of illness. It is where our biggest and baddest bugs are hanging out. And so obviously, if a patient needs to come into the hospital, that's what we're there for. IV antibiotics would be a great example. But you really want to think long and hard about whether you're doing that patient a service or disservice by bringing them into the healthcare environment. Now, a totally different question, right, is what about outpatient pneumonia in Wisconsin? And so uh, a lot of us listening to the call today might be infection preventionists at community hospitals. We might be quality improvement professionals at, at community hospitals. We might be emergency physicians or um, primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, APPs at community hospitals. You'll be dealing with hospital-acquired pneumonia actually relatively seldom. What you'll be seeing relatively frequently is this. Um, our patient on the right here is 25 years old. She has no past medical history, no allergies, takes no drugs. She's here with a fever, five days of productive cough, Right midfield crackles again. A low bar infiltrate, it's there. You got to squint a little bit, but it's definitely there. Her O2 stats are fine. And you decide, listen, her CURB 65 score is zero. Her DRIP score is zero. All comers, this is strep pneumo until proven otherwise, I'm going to discharge her. We live in Wisconsin. What sort of pills do you want to put her on? So again, consult your local biogram. For my hospital and my general recommendations would be doxycycline or augmentin. If the patient failed Augmentin or Doxy, so if they're, if they're on either one of the, well, Doxy should actually cover atypicals. It should cover both strep and atypicals. Augmentin would, would primarily cover strep. So if you start your patient on Augmentin and they fail therapy, it's now five days later, they bounce back to the ED, or you get a call from their primary, hey, Augmentin's not working. At that time, I would add my macrolide or my azithromycin. And then if they fail azithromycin, as a third line, I would start Levaquin or Moxifloxacin, a respiratory fluoroquinolone. But basically, that's how I like to use my broad spectrum agents. You start narrow and you add agents as needed. Remember, the worst case scenario here is a treatment failure. Treatment failure does not usually mean sepsis. Treatment failure does not usually mean death. Treatment failure usually means a patient who had moderate symptomatic improvement or stayed the same and is coming back to you because they're not getting better fast enough. By and large, with healthy individuals, you have time for a trial of therapy. And if we treat empirically for narrow uh, therapy, we will do our community a, a service and we will have a healthier biome. Our drugs will last longer. We'll be able to um, be nice to our patients' pocketbooks by giving them generic drugs with low side effect profiles. So there are a lot of arguments to treat empirically in a narrow fashion like this. The other thing that I would really encourage are short courses of antibiotics. I do not use 10 to 14 day courses of antibiotics. It is such a rare occurrence that I'm gonna say essentially across the board that is not happening in my practice pattern. Five days for minor symptoms, seven days for moderate symptoms. If you haven't gotten back better after seven days, you should really be seen, being seen by your primary care physician to see if something new is going on or if you've been misdiagnosed. Um, there is a lot of good literature on short courses of antibiotics. We are actually putting together a webinar on exactly that topic. Um, and so I'm happy to take questions on short courses of antibiotics as well. But the, the take home point here is that these 10 to 14 day courses that are recommended in so many different types of literature are really not based on evidence. They're based on what people started doing when antibiotics first came out. And we are nudging that needle down, down, down towards shorter courses of antibiotics. It's review time. We've got 20 minutes for questions as promised. Here's the, here's the, uh, the back of the envelope, take home points that you can share with your colleagues one slide that you can take a screenshot of and email out to your ED, to your hospitalist, to your ICU. Healthcare associated pneumonia don't, no longer exists. If it's on your treatment care plan, if it's on any of your hospital protocols, those needs to be revised. Please put that on your to-do list for your next antimicrobial stewardship meeting, for your next clinical care committee meeting. We need to get HCAP out of existence. It is still around in Wisconsin. I see it when I review your biograms, when I review your treatment care guidelines. So we got to get it gone. 
If the pneumonia came around less than 48 hours post-admit, it's community-acquired pneumonia, treat narrowly for strep, unless they have high risk for multidrug resistant organisms. You can get sophisticated with things like a DRIP score. If it occurred greater than 48 hours post-admit, it's healthcare-acquired pneumonia or hospital-acquired pneumonia. You would now want to consider MRSA and pseudomonal coverage based on your hospital biogram. If you have sophisticated rapid diagnostics like Tristan Center does, that would be a great thing to incorporate into your local algorithm. If it's greater than 48 hours post ET tube, that's ventilator-associated pneumonia, those patients are at high risk for those MRSA and gram-negative organisms. Again, you're going to want to consider things like MRSA coverage and double pseudomonal coverage. Rapid diagnostics, by and large, are not here yet, but we're close. For community-acquired pneumonia, as we said, treat empirically with a uh, strep coverage. Consider the DRIP score to risk stratify for multidrug-resistant organism risk. CURB-65 is a great thing to help you decide whether to admit or not. Is the hospital really the best place for my patient? The answer might be no. We have a lot of bad bugs in the hospital. Sometimes home is better, but you need good idea of what you're treating for, good idea that they're low risk for mortality, and good idea that they can get adequate outpatient follow-up. And then finally, for outpatient, uncomplicated, community-acquired pneumonia in Wisconsin, cover strep narrowly with something like Augmentin or doxycycline for a five-day course. If the patient doesn't get better, add azithromycin. If the patient doesn't get better after that, you can broaden it to a broad-spectrum agent like a respiratory fluoroquinolone. The exception for this would be if you had a strong suspicion for a walking pneumonia or atypical pneumonia for some reason, then you might want to start with doxycycline or azithromycin. I hope we didn't get it too far into the weeds. I'm sure we all have a lot of good questions, and I'm going to open up the floor. So please type questions into your chat box. We'll announce them to the group and get you guys the information you need. Thank you. So as, as we wait for questions, and I want questions, guys, <laughs> this, is, I, this is so hospital dependent. And so if you have a question, there's a very good chance multiple people on the line have the same question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose a question we had in my own shop. What do we do about COPD? So we sort of touched on this. You're in the ED setting. You get a COPD or everything about it looks viral. You know, it is multiple family members had a virus. They have cough. They have sniffles. You do a chest X-ray. You find no infiltrate. They turn around after a couple of NEBs and a dose of IV steroids. You're motivated to get this patient home, and you're wondering, do they need antibiotics at all, right? You don't have a strong case for a pneumonia. If you look at the GOLD criteria, the GOLD criteria is telling you, for a moderate to severe COPD exacerbation, give the patient azithromycin. You're wise. You know that azithromycin is garbage in the Midwest against strep pneumo. You're thinking, well, it still works for atypicals. Is it worth giving them this drug? My practice is this. If it is a slam dunk virus and it's mild COPD, I don't even send the blood test. I break gold criteria and I send that patient home with no antibiotic. I tell them, I think this is a COPD exacerbation triggered by a virus. If it gets worse, not better, just come back to us. We'll get you your antibiotic. If it is a patient who I'm kind of on the fence about, it's moderate, their symptoms haven't fully resolved, they're elderly, have a high risk of comorbidities, I will then use a procalcitonin. It is FDA approved for distinguishing viral versus bacterial upper, upper respiratory infections. If I have a negative procalcitonin, I will then send the patient home with confidence that this is viral. If they have a positive procalcitonin, I will add the azithromycin or doxycycline. I bet some of you had that question. That's why I asked it. Anything in the chat bar? Right on. Okay, this is gonna be last call for questions. Um, we are always available for email questions as well. And we actually have a webinar coming up July 22nd uh, where we take requests. So we've actually gathered all of your guys' questions from the last calendar year and put together a webinar specifically to talk about things like COPD, to talk about things like short course antibiotics, um, and, we'll be, and uh, C. diff. So we'll be bringing those to you in July. And it looks like we do have a question in our chat box now. What are we using for kids first line? 
Awesome. What are we using for pediatric pneumonias? Uh, same thing. So I would say amoxicillin or augmentin are both totally appropriate. You could broaden that to a cephalosporin, something like Omnicef, but essentially similar to adults. Doxycycline in very young um, children is not recommended because it can give them gray teeth. Um, and so, again, you, al you always want to think about these drugs in the context of your patient. When we talk about antibiotics, we're largely talking about adult populations, and things get a little bit more nuanced when you get into that pediatric population. But I would say cephalosporins and um, penicillins are totally appropriate for pediatric pneumonia. Remember, in kids, there's a ton of reactive airway disease. Um, and so, especially in an asthmatic child, you want to presume asthma unless you have a strong reason to think pneumonia and avoid getting a chest x-ray in an asthmatic who's wheezing. All right, next question. You share rapid diagnostics is not here yet, but close. What do you refer to? What do I refer to? Okay. I, th I think what the, the questioner is asking is, why are you not saying they're here? We have somebody calling in saying we're already using them. Was that Tristan again? No. Okay. <laughs> here's, here's what I would say is, at WHA, we are trying to help um, improve quality. What is quality? It is outcomes over cost. Okay? And so, by and large, we're talking about best practices that are being recommended by specialty societies and population health societies on what we can really apply across big populations of patients. Now, there are a lot of rapid diagnostic tests out there, and we don't usually talk about individual companies here because we don't want to have an influence for commercial bias or anything like that. But if you have one of these reps come into your health system, they are going to tell you that these rapid diagnostics are ready for prime time. There was a large systematic review on rapid diagnostics for pneumonia in 2017, and it said the exact opposite. It said we are not there yet. That means while there are individual studies saying that these tests are working, and you might have anecdotal evidence that these tests are working, they have not been prospectively validated to the point that they're FDA approved and in general practice yet. So if you have a health system that's well-resourced and wants to advance the field and use rapid diagnostics in a way that other, people, other hospitals aren't necessarily doing yet, I think that's amazing. I think that's good for patient care, and I think there's a strong financial argument for it. That being said, here at the Hospital Association, in terms of giving you broad recommendations that would work for any hospital in the state, I just don't think we're there yet. I think we need a systematic review that says these are FDA approved, these have been prospectively validated, and this is how you should incorporate them into your algorithm. Now, what we do do is at the Quality Center is we share a lot of resources. So if you would like to email me a resource that you use, if you have an algorithm that incorporates um, rapid diagnostics, I would love to see that algorithm. And if I find a health system that is like yours, that has very active antimicrobial stewardship program, that is resourced enough in terms to incorporate that into their algorithm, I would love to share that with them and say, hey, have you tried this yet? Health system A is doing rapid PCR for pneumonia, for MRSA. Um, do you think that would fit into your healthcare setting? I think that's very appropriate. So we just have to recognize that we're on a webinar here. We're giving content to large health systems, to small hospitals, and I don't think rapid diagnostics are that advanced that we can make a broad recommendation yet. Next question is a two-parter. What is the role of sputum culture collection for pneumonia? When should a sputum culture be collected? There is, um, that is a role for your hospital's antimicrobial stewardship committee to put it into a diagnostic algorithm and then up to individual clinicians to send one when they want to. So what I would say is um, if you have low, let's, the, a theoretical hospital where you had low incidence of all multi-drug resistant organisms, you might not need sputum cultures at all, you know. If you have a patient who um, gets very sick and, or a patient who get sicker despite treatment, at that point, you're going to want all information on what you're treating. So you're going to want to get an expectorant culture, or if they're intubated, you're going to want to do some um, deep suctioning and try to get some sputum to send for culture, just so if your treatment continues to not work, you have something to use it for. Most of our hospitals have some sort of multidrug resistant organism. So most of us have MRSA. Most of us have pseudomonas. Most of us are concerned enough against multidrug resistant organisms that for our hospitalized patients and our ICU patients, we're going to be recommending um, sputum cultures in some fashion. The problem here is you don't want to test everybody because if you test everybody, you're going to be getting these false positives. You're going to be getting um, sputum that has MRSA in it, but the patient doesn't really have a MRSA pneumonia clinical picture, you end up treating for it, you're going to get a lot of ambiguous information that isn't really helping the treatment course. 
So by and large, I would say when a patient is very sick, they should have a sputum culture. When you have a very high incidence of MRSA and pseudomonas, you should have sputum cultures built into your algorithms for ICU patients and possibly for hospital level patients. And then when you have a patient in your ED or in an outpatient setting who you're particularly concerned about, let's say their DRIP score is 12. Let's say you have a high suspicion for pseudomonas because they've had it in the past and have thick, creamy sputum. These are patients where you would want to get a sputum culture, even if it's not in your algorithm. So I think that's an area where there's still a lot of clinical gestalt and still based on your hospital biogram. And you could probably talk to your infectious disease doctors and your pulmonologists for some guidance on how to incorporate that, incorporate that into your family practice population or your ED population. I hope I didn't hedge too much there. I was trying to give you a real world answer. It's complicated. What I don't recommend is sputum cultures for everybody. So the, the worst practice would be respiratory therapy is getting a sputum culture on all pneumonia patients in the ED. You that just a recipe for overtreatment and for clinical confusion. What I don't recommend is um, is sputum cultures that are basically spitting into the cup. You really need to expectorate from your trachea. You really need like the thick gunky stuff from deep down. If you're spitting into your cup, you're just giving yourself um, again increasing the risk for clinical confusion and for overtreatment based on bad data. So sputum cultures are very imperfect. You want to make sure it's a good uh, collection and you want to make sure you're not just screening by doing um, sputum cultures on everyone. That's a tool that I use pretty selectively and actually use pretty rarely in the ED. I'm using that on septic patients. These are good questions. We've got seven more minutes. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave a pregnant pause for a minute, see if anybody gets bold and chimes in. Okay, I'll pose another question from my hospital. What do we do about quinolones? Levaquin? Moxifloxacin, what do we do about them? I'll tell you what we know about quinolones. These are high-risk medications by every stretch of the imagination. First of all, quinolones are expensive. Second of all, they um, are drivers of CDI and C. diff uh, infections in our community. And obviously C. diff is kind of out of control right now. And we are trying to do everything we can to um, put patients at a lower risk for CDI infections. Quinolones are a major driver of that. Third, they have a broad and dangerous side effect profile. So they cause tendinopathies in the elderly. They mess with your warfarin, your INR levels. They are QT prolonging agents. If you look at the list of drugs that they interact with, it is a laundry list. Fourth of all, or fifth, wherever we're at, um, we need these drugs. Quinolones are one of our few outpatient pill treatments for pseudomonas. They're one of our few outpatient pill treatments for um, upper uh, urinary tract infection for pyelonephritis. If we use these willy-nilly on um, community-acquired pneumonia and, community, and regular cystitis, we are going to lose fluoroquinolones. To put it in perspective, ciprofloxacin resistance rates in the Midwest are now greater than 35%. So we are, I mean, we have maybe already lost um, ciprofloxacin in terms of E. coli. So we are in danger of losing our quinolones pretty fast if we don't rein them in significantly. So as an emergency physician, I'm always tempted to give Levaquin. It's so easy. It's broad spectrum. It's a pill. You know, it's, this one's actually generic. You can just give it to everybody, right? That would be a major mistake. That would drive C. diff rates. That would drive resistance. That would give you a lot of adverse drug event, um, reactions. And so for emergency physicians in the audience, for primary care physicians in the audience, Please try to avoid using quinolones for treatment failures. Try to start with things like doxycycline and augmentin, add azithromycin if, the, if that's not working, and then really reserve levaquin and moxifloxacin for bad pneumonias that aren't getting better with the usual drugs. That's what, how you can serve your community and your individual patients best. And that's tough to hear. It's really tempting to use that single agent. Thank you for giving me your lunch hour, everyone. It's been a really good discussion. I appreciate the questions, and we'll be back on July 22nd taking your requests on antimicrobial stewardship. Thank you all for joining the Journal Club. Um, I will be emailing all participants in the live session a document with instructions on how to get your CME credit. 
Please note that the portal will be active starting right after this event and will close on June 6th at 4 p.m. You cannot do it after and we can't help you if you miss that deadline. Again, this is offered only for those who have been here for the live session. We will also make the recording available to everyone soon. Please join us again on July 22nd for the second part of our series, Dr. Redwood Takes Requests, Antimicrobial Stewardship Principles in the Management of COPD, C. diff, and tick-borne illnesses. If you have a need for any of the other HIN topics, please let us know and we'd be happy to put together education. Thank you everyone and have a great rest of your week.